Good afternoon. You have heard in the last two days an astonishing series of original and forward-looking papers that confer seabed prehistoric research as a mainstream intellectual component of archaeology. In every paper there's been a description of recent discoveries, a promise of rapid future technical growth and improved intellectual understanding. In this summary, I will try to fit these developments into a model of how the subject has developed over the last hundred years and how the curve of growth and increase of knowledge continues onwards and upwards in a logical way. Several of the speakers have expressed well-founded views on the future priorities, so I'm going to focus a bit on predictive methodologies. The argument to be presented will be an outline of the growth of this subject in the last hundred years, my previous attempts at forecasting in different disciplines, examples of various forecasts, then evidence from the present papers and my final conclusion. I'm not going to read the details on this slide. You can browse it yourself and look at it later if you want to. The early 19th century has been quite well documented just in terms of uh, recognition of submerged terrestrial landscapes. Then in the second half of the 20th century, the discovery of seabed in situ stratified deposits, especially in the Baltic and the coast of uh, Mediterranean coast of Israel, and then increasing uh, collaboration until we get to the Splash Goss uh, project and discovery of sites pre last glacial maximum, uh, the involvement of research in Australia and the USA, and then finally, very significantly in the last year, the ability of teams to work consistently in multidisciplinary research to identify seabed sites in areas where there were no previous sites known. That is to say, they were able to work from first principles, not from the clues given by chance finds previously. Forecasting development in different subjects, is to, I have some previous experience. In the 60s, I worked on the prediction of marine technology for commercial groups. And then the UN Law of the Sea Conference. I did some work on prehistoric archaeology, the Geological Society, and then various other assessments up to the European Marine Board Strategic Framework in 2014. The forecasting techniques vary from trying to fit to the existing trends either a linear straight line, power law, log law, exponential S-curve with growth of flattening and so on, and to extrapolate this into the future in, to an extent which you think is reasonable, <clears throat> to identify various technological and social factors which may cause nonlinear jumps. I should explain for the younger members of the audience the Sheikh Yamani factor. In the 1970s, when Sheikh Yamani was a representative of the OPEC oil cartel, he was being quizzed on the eventual exhaustion of oil and therefore people moving to other resources. He admitted that oil would eventually cease to be our main source of energy, but pointed out that the Stone Age came to an end not because people ran out of stones, but because they found other technologies. And that is a very important point when trying to extrapolate curves into the future. My first and probably most important experience of trying to make technological forecasts was for a group of large British companies in 1966 to 67. I predicted at the time that manganese nodules would not be exploited for many decades. Uh, this was a complete contradiction of what everybody expected at that time. They really thought they would be exploited within a few years. I got the rate of growth of depth of oil and gas exploitation about right, fish farming about right. 
I predicted the increase in depth and duration of diving excursions extremely accurately and even predicted the exact time and date of John Bevan's deep dive. I won't read all the details here, but there were plenty of failures as well. I didn't foresee subsea fibre optic cables at all, but they didn't come until the 1980s, uh, which was really beyond the 10-year horizon that I was working to. I thought that container ships would grow uh, beyond 500,000 tonnes, but they didn't. It stopped around two or 300,000. Uh, I saw that satellites could be used to measure marine weather, but not the seawater and oceanographic properties. I didn't foresee uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, though I did see ROVs coming. My next operation was in the Law of the Sea, where I was the uh, scientific advisor to the British uh, delegation to the Law of the Sea Committee, uh, picking up the data from the previous uh, commercial study. Um, the United Nations at the time hoped that the exploitation of manganese nodules in the international area of the sea could be licensed this would produce sufficient funds to support the costs of the United Nations as a whole. I had to point out that this was not going to be the case, and it was a rather unpopular prediction, but absolutely correct. Um, Deepwater hydrocarbon production and manganese nodules I've already mentioned. Uh, the coastal development of mangrove forests was In far as continental shelf prehistory is concerned, I had several examples uh, to describe. The first really was what called now casting, that's to say analysis of the present trends and then stopping at the present but attempting to guess what's going to happen next. Uh, then an analysis for the Council of British Archaeology and for the European Archaeological Association and the European Marine Board strategic This was my now cast for the Jolsock in 1998. It's a prediction or rather a, a plotting of the increase in uh, age of sites uh, over the years. It starts in the 18th and 19th century finding classical towns submerged in the Mediterranean and then goes into prehistoric sites deeper and deeper, and finding older material back to a Shirley and Hand axis and so on in Table Bay. And obviously this is going to come to a stop. I mean, once we've found material in the early Paleolithic, the curve doesn't go on into millions of years. So that the curve itself plots what's happened in the past, uh, shows that the age, all the ages are uh, periods within which tools can be found and then comes to a stop. If we look at uh, increase in depth, you get the same sort of phenomenon. The curve uh, continues uh, from the uh, 18th and 19th century, deeper and deeper to 50 to 100 meters and then comes to a stop. And obviously we're not going to go off the edge of the shelf, so that the ax absolute maximum is going to be about 100 Mark Twain said that prediction is a dangerous game, particularly about the future. And this is one of my uh, most uh, adventurous attempts to make predictions for submarine prehistoric archaeology. In 2010, I gave a paper to the uh, Council of British Archaeology, and I plotted a curve which goes on the uh, y-axis to date from 1900 to 2050. And this is the number of sites, uh, uh, prehistoric sites on the sea floor which has been discovered on a log scale, so that's 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. You can see that by 2050, I predicted over 10,000 sites would be known, and that in just after 2000, I've got over a thousand sites, which is probably about right. 
but I don't really know why I put this strange bend in the curve. A straight line through there would really have fitted quite well. Nevertheless, it does show that the increase in number of sites should continue on a log curve at least for a few more years to come, uh, 10,000 sites, possibly more. For the European Archaeology uh, Association, I did a table of benefits in 2009, actually before Splash Goss. This isn't a prediction as such, but it's a list of all the different subjects which 169 agencies said were of interest to them in studying uh, submarine or offshore prehistory. And it shows that we have an enormous resource base of skills and capabilities which could be deployed in splash costs and future research. There's a key factor which has become clear to me in the last few years about the change in hominin adaptability and intelligence as it might be applied uh, to water crossing. There's always been some doubt about uh, pre-modern, pre-sapiens uh, human beings being able to cross uh, large water masses because they wouldn't be able to communicate, collaborate, plan the building of boats and rafts, or even plan the number of people working together simply to swim as a group. But what's become clear in the last few years is that uh, modern Homo sapiens genetics includes uh, DNA components from Denisovans, Neanderthals, and other unnamed species, which have interbred through introgression with successive waves of migrants from Africa. The proposed unique genetic mutation, which produced super uh, intellectual Homo sapiens therefore may not be necessary in order to explain the ability uh, which is needed to, to plan water crossing. If we look at the genetics, I apologize for the mixture of this slide a bit. It is a fundamental uh, research paper by Omar Gokumen um, on the uh, crossover integration of genetics, uh, which actually has a, a much better uh, graphic in The Economist on October the 3rd of 2020. But what it shows is the crossover of genes between the various subspecies of human beings going back 100,000 years or more. And to my mind, this suggests that pre-homo sapiens are quite likely to have had much more sophisticated ability in planning, executive function, and so on. If these different species had been so different that they could not breed and produce fertile offspring, which themselves were seen as uh, potential mates, uh, then this sort of development would not have occurred. The different species must have recognized each other as being very closely related. To develop this idea even further, been a very, very interesting paper by Dylan Gaffney on Pleistocene water crossings and adaptive flexibility, and effectively it's pre-homo sapien. I found this paper a real revolution and a revelation. revelation. Uh, which shows that the potential for crossing water channels more than 30, 40, 50,000 years ago uh, is really quite high. Um, paradoxically, this means that the uh, crossing into Australia or into the Australian um, Papua New Guinea landmass and the crossing of Beringia into the Americas are not really the greatest challenge. Uh, some of the most interesting research now involves the diffusion in the islands of Wallacea and even the crossing from the Middle East across the uh, South Aegean and into Northern Europe uh, by pre-sapiens uh, subspecies. I'm going to show you a graph which arose from discussions about the rate at which uh, human intelligence 
technology and uh, coordination might increase through time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a graph uh, which was worked out by my son, Peter Fleming, and I hope other people in the audience uh, may sometimes have to rely on the next generation or two uh, to do programming for them. Uh, later, you'll be able to uh, download the graph if you want to uh, by using the QR uh, plot here. I'm going to show you the graph in the next slide. This curve uh, arises because of a conversation I had with Jeff Bailey some years ago, uh, trying to suggest whether there was a law of technological growth uh, which could be extended from the Paleolithic to the modern period. Um, what I was concerned with was the idea of a graph which had um, a, a doubling time of capability uh, of perhaps half a million years or more in the Paleolithic and that that doubling time reduced by some constant factor so that it got shorter and shorter until you got to something like Moore's law with a doubling time in two or three years. Um, Peter worked on this and came to the conclusion that the best way to represent it was a family of curves based on the reciprocal of x, 1 over x. And you can see here, roughly speaking, what the curve looks like in a general way and the way it tails away. This is time going back into the past here. And as you can see, as we come up to the future, it gets faster and faster until it's asymptotic to the present. But one can vary the key constants here, uh, which determine the shape of the curve so that you can make it steeper or you can make the rate of curve into the past so that it enables you to uh, model a system where people are still quite clever back in the Paleolithic or you can adjust it uh, that way so that it looks as if people are going to cut off quite early in the Mesolithic and don't have many skills before that. Um, the tangent has been put on here, which you can also play with, because it shows how dangerous and misleading it is to look backwards down the curve and project it quite steeply uh, into the past, which gives the appearance that people were really not very clever uh, quite a short time ago. Alabi et al. addressed the first item here, uh, talking about the uh, Neanderthal material from the North Sea. And I should add that uh, the Dutch dredging onto the beach supply has produced uh, many Neanderthal bones completely out of context, but at least confirming that there are more out in the North Sea. On item two, uh, Finlay and Ben Sharada produced an excellent paper and what I'm hoping uh, in the medium term is that the rate of processing uh, can speed up to the point that one could take multiple cores and develop gradients around sites much more quickly and focus in on the, the source of uh, uh, key DNA. If we look at item three, um, the acoustic resonance of uh, blades is something that's been studied by uh, several research groups now in Denmark and the USA. I know the technique has not been proven, uh, but if it works, it's really going to be uh, quite a breakthrough. In item four, the pre-Sapiens ex expansion in the islands of uh, Wallacea and around the Sunda Arc are really absolutely fundamental. And if we can establish that uh, pre-Sapiens uh, seafaring uh, was already active, uh, it, it will confirm some of the ideas of Robert Budnari, who's been treated as uh, something of a maverick up to this point. In item five, uh, Jeff Bailey has been very keen in promoting the submergence of, of shell middens. And if more of these could be found underwater, it would be a great advance. Item six, um, there's been terrific progress in North Australia. Both uh, Helen Farr and Jonathan Benjamin separately have reported on uh, major projects there, and I'm a great enthusiast for this, as I was involved in uh, surveys of the Kutamantra Shoals in the 1980s. 
Not surprisingly, item seven has uh, attracted most of the papers. Um, and there's been reports by um, yeah, Kenneth Harding et al., uh, Petz, uh, Walker et al., Cottrell, Momba, um, Gaffney, uh, Bino, Tissart, and so on, all describing phenomenal advances in our understanding of the prehistoric archaeology of all the sea areas uh, around the British Isles. The submerged analysis on a global scale, uh, Jeff Bailey has touched on, uh, this is fundamental now because uh, the continental shelf of the entire world was occupied uh, by uh, Homo sapiens. And as I pointed out uh, above, uh, the pre-Sapiens exploration of Southeast Asia is particularly important. And item nine, Harris and Bat described essential research. And again, I hope that the increased speed of work and uh, quick analysis will enable uh, more rapid uh, gradient analysis across uh, critical sites. Item 10, the computer models, there's all sorts of ways that this could go. But Murgatroyd et al. have shown the potential uh, for improvements here. And I'm sure there's going to be massive advance in the next few years. Institutional collaboration is something that Jeff Bailey and I have discussed at uh, several uh, meetings. And Jeff has pointed out uh, several times that the different disciplines, the representatives ten tend to stay within their comfort zone. Uh, I know this sounds a bit critical, but uh, people tend to come from different institutions for different disciplines, um, attend and listen most intently to papers on the subject they already know, and then go back to their home base. They don't spend enough time studying disciplines with which they're not familiar. Item 12, uh, new courses at institutes is something which we hope to come out as flash costs. Um, I think that economic problems of recent years have made that uh, problematic. Uh, but I hope that uh, meetings like today's uh, will help uh, promote the uh, commitment of institutions to setting up courses which will endure in the future. Item 13, uh, Jeff referred to migration along the north coast of the Mediterranean, the Neolithic, and there's been quite a few papers in the uh, published academic literature on this subject. The Paleolithic occupation of the southern Aegean is something uh, that Dimitri Sakellariou has been looking at and his archaeological uh, colleagues in, in Greece. The resolution of the uh, crossing of the southern uh, Red Sea is something which will take time. Um, both the evidence from on land and the evidence from the sea will gradually accumulate to establish whether a crossing really did occur there or not. Item 16, uh, this isn't something which is the responsibility of our community, but the range of studies of skull type, um, hearing ability, uh, speech analysis, social structure and so on of pre-sapiens hominin all supports the idea that there could have been a competence in seafaring, boat building, collaborative crossing of sea channels and so on more than 50,000 years ago. And item 17, uh, somewhat the same, but the, there have been several papers recently, not only Gaffney's, on the social dynamics of water crossing. What did people have to do to collaborate to get a sufficient number of people onto the far side uh, to create a stable and continuing population. There's been very little discussion of uh, automatic underwater vehicles, autonomous, autonomous underwater vehicles uh, at this meeting, but they do have terrific potential for surveying in a very boring and monotonous way on a closely spaced grid close to the sea floor in such a way that might uh, reveal um, anthropogenic materials of a prehistoric nature. And finally, although it may be completely chance, there's the potential for discovery of uh, early rafts, log boats, and so on, 
uh, which would help us understand the crossings and marine exploitation of resources in the prehistoric time. I hope that this list gives you some ideas of the potential for growth in the future, and I hope you will all be involved in the most efficient and successful research in those areas. Thank you very much for listening.